There's something about a bridge that is at once inspirational and humbling. It seems to leap undaunted across chasms once thought unleapable. It lays itself over waters once thought uncrossable, over gorges once thought impassable. A bridge is the perfect marriage of architecture and engineering, of art and science. As a metaphor, it means a connection between ideas and things once thought unconnected. In reality, it makes distant shores accessible. There's something about a bridge that is eternal. The Golden Gate Bridge is the epitome of what a bridge should be. Standing tall and proud at the entrance of the San Francisco Bay, it travels over the treacherous waters of the Golden Gate. There's a plaque on the bridge put there by the American Institute of Steel Construction. It calls it the most beautiful steel bridge in the world. But don't trust them. Look at it for yourself. And far away or close up, every detail is a work of art, from the minutest steel plate to the massive Art Deco towers. bridge is not just beautiful. It is a vital link in a major transportation corridor connecting Northern and Southern California. An average of 97,000 vehicles cross the bridge daily. And at one or two dollars a car, running the bridge is big business. The Golden Gate Bridge serves as a symbol of the city of San Francisco, a tourist attraction to out-of-towners, and a familiar icon to the natives. The Golden Gate Bridge is so much a part of Bay Area life that it's hard to believe there once was a time when it did not exist. And that time wasn't so very long ago. At the turn of the century, San Francisco was a booming town of 200,000 people and 10,000 horses. In the next few years, two things would occur that would change the face of this city forever. A devastating earthquake and fire and the arrival of the automobile. As San Francisco built itself up from the ashes, more people arrived and more cars were bought and sold. The city's site on the peninsula made it well suited for a seaport but the water hindered automobile traffic. Ferry boat service allowed commuters and weekend motorists to travel to Oakland and Marin County, but as time passed and the number of car owners increased, these ferry boats became overcrowded, and an hour wait at the loading dock was not unusual. In 1916, a San Francisco newspaper man who commuted to San Francisco from Marin began writing a series of articles promoting the idea of a bridge at the water gap between the Lime Point Lighthouse and Fort Scott. These articles received a wide readership and undoubtedly caught the attention of Michael O'Shaughnessy, chief engineer of San Francisco, and a middle-aged bridge builder from Chicago who was in town on business. An engineer by the name of Joseph Strauss was in San Francisco constructing some bascule bridges for the city, notably the large bascule bridge that's down on 3rd Street or China Basin. And I can kind of envision or imagine what might have taken place on 
some afternoon or one afternoon down there when O'Shaughnessy, who was a city engineer of the city of San Francisco, came down to see how things were going and was talking with uh, Joseph Strauss and O'Shaughnessy brought up the fact that he'd he's been trying to find somebody who would show him that a bridge could be built across the Golden Gate, and that the, the Golden Gate could be spanned. And Strauss, being the, the type of person he was, he was a real hard driver, a real spark plug, and just, again, imagining what he might have said, and he said, well, you know, I can build a bridge across anything. So O'Shaughnessy and Strauss talked some more about that, and O'Shaughnessy said, you're on, Joe. Show me what kind of a bridge you can build across the Golden Gate. So with that commission in hand, Strauss went to work, and we must remember at this time that Strauss had little or no experience in suspension bridges. He had patents for movable bridges, and uh, he was an expert in bascule bridges. Strauss made a report to O'Shaughnessy, and while it isn't dated, as near as I can tell, the date was in 1921 or 1922, and he presented to O'Shaughnessy a report that showed, of all things, a, a quite enlarged version of his Third Street Bascule Bridge turned around, and a, some type of a suspension bridge hung off of the ends of the bascule bridge where the counterweights would normally be. And he estimated that the cost of this bridge would be within reason, about uh, $20 million or so, and that he said this is a bridge that could, that could span the Golden Gate. Strauss's plans lay idle on O'Shaughnessy's desk for over a year. In fact, O'Shaughnessy had cooled to the idea. But Strauss was now obsessed with bridging the gate. He and other like-minded individuals traveled through the North Bay counties promoting the idea. At a mass meeting held in Santa Rosa in January 1923, legislation was drafted to establish the Golden Gate Bridge and Highway District and give it the power to levy taxes and issue bonds. In such a way, money for the bridge could be raised. Opposition to the bridge was fierce for a variety of reasons. Some thought building such a structure was impossible. Others felt that the toll revenues would not be sufficient to pay back bondholders. Large landowners to the north feared increased traffic. Southern Pacific Railroad operator of the ferries feared the loss of business income. And the War Department objected in principle to anything built over vital shipping lanes. Through civil suits and litigation, these opponents would delay construction of the bridge for 10 years. But Strauss and the bridge district prevailed. Bonds went up for sale and construction started on January 5, 1933. The modern suspension bridge is a feat of engineering genius, and although the form is not new, its design has taken centuries to perfect. Suspension bridges appeared about 2,000 years ago in China. Some of them were made of bamboo cables, simply by twisting the bamboo to ropes, and some of them were made out of iron chains. Now, the first bridge builder we know anything about who built iron chain bridges was called Tang Stong Gyal Po. He was a Tibetan monk, but he also built chain suspension bridges, and you can see in his left hand a couple of links of chain, which are his attribute. Some of the bridges he built are still in existence in Tibet and in Bhutan. It took about 1,200 years for bridges of this type to be built in the West. The first of them were built in England, and then some soon on the continent. James Finley of Pennsylvania was the first to build a suspension bridge with a suspended horizontal deck, which means a deck hung underneath the chains. This kind of bridge could be used for wheeled traffic, and the system soon began to spread all over because of that. About 20 years after Finley built his bridges, 
Wire cables were first used for suspension bridges. Now wire can take a lot more tension than chains can, even though they're made of exactly the same material, iron. The first permanent wire cable bridge was built in Geneva in Switzerland over the ramparts of the town. The builder was Guillaume Henri Dufour and the bridge was finished and opened to the public in, in 1824. It took about another 20 years for the new system to reach the United States. Charles Ellet, who was educated in France, built the first wire cable suspension bridges in America. He was soon followed by a man who had come from Germany, John Roebling, and his son Washington Roebling, who then finally built the Brooklyn Bridge, which is 100 years old. From then on, the largest bridges were all built in the United States, and the United States became the leader in this type of bridge building. In 1931, Otmar Amman built the first gigantic cable suspension bridge in New York over the Hudson River, the George Washington Bridge. The George Washington Bridge was a lot simpler than the bridges that had preceded it, but it was a mere six years later when the world record was captured by the Golden Gate Bridge here in San Francisco, which was even longer. There are four main parts to a suspension bridge. The roadway which supports traffic, the cables which support the roadway, and the towers and anchorages which support the cables. Unlike the other main types of bridges, arch, cantilever, and beam, the suspension bridge can span long and treacherous gaps because the entire support system, anchorages, towers, and cables, are built first. The roadway is hung later, so there's no chance of collapse during construction. And unlike the other bridges, which are of a rigid design, a suspension bridge is flexible and can adapt to its environment making it well suited for areas of high wind, great temperature fluctuations, and earthquake. A suspension bridge is also lovely to look at. The simple lines and graceful curve of the cables give it an elegance rarely achieved in structures so large. But that grace is deceiving. The cables and towers must work hard to support heavy and often changing weight loads. By the time construction of the Golden Gate Bridge started, Strauss's original design had been thrown out in favor of a full suspension bridge advocated by his associates, Clifford Payne, O.H. Amon, Charles Derleth, and Leon Moisef. One of the first and thorniest problems was building the concrete piers upon which the towers would rest. The Marin Pier is founded on very substantial hard rock, Franciscan, Franciscan shale, and it's almost in the dry. It's just right at the edge, right in, right in the tide zone. However, because of the limitation of the span of the Golden Gate Bridge, it required that the San Francisco Pier be almost a quarter of a mile out in water, and in quite deep water. The water is uh, 100 feet, almost 100 feet deep at the San Francisco Pier. In addition, the underlying rock wasn't of the same quality on the San Francisco side, under the San Francisco Pier, that was under the Marin Pier. So very special studies had to be made of the rock on the San Francisco Pier. That, the, that rock is largely serpentine rock. And serpentine isn't nearly as strong as other types of rock, particularly the Franciscan shale. So a lot of attention had to be paid to the San Francisco Pier design. And if any one thing would have made it impossible to build a bridge across the Golden Gate, that one thing could have been it. But the pier was constructed and in excess of 100 feet of raging tide water. A fender was first built to protect the pier from the ravages of the sea. The ground was leveled, wood supports assembled, and concrete poured all underwater. In the meantime, the design of the towers had the structural engineers burning the midnight oil. The stresses in the towers were very complex. 
1932, 1933—all the engineers had was slide rules and logarithms and pencils, no calculators, and there was no way to impose all of the different forces on the design of the tower at the same time like we can now simulate with a computer. We can actually computer model all the forces that are in that tower. To design the towers, many assumptions had to be made to start out with, and then a series of 29 simultaneous algebraic equations had to be solved. Uh, that meant that it was a series of equations with 28 unknowns that all had to be solved simultaneously for each level or step in the tower. And that must have been some job because it had to be performed many times over. Construction of the Marin Tower began in November of 1933, even before the San Francisco Pier was completed. It was built of steel cells, which like all of the steel to be used on the bridge, was precast in Pennsylvania and shipped via railroad to Alameda, a short barge trip from the construction site. The steel cells were hauled from the barges to the top of the rising tower by a derrick, which could be raised as the tower proceeded skyward. Upon completion of the San Francisco Pier, construction of its tower began immediately and was finished in the summer of 1935, nine and a half months after the Marin Tower. The gate was ready to be bridged. The first structures to actually span the gate were two foot bridges, built to give the workmen access to the main cables during their construction. Uh, the firm, contracting firm of John A. Roebling's sons who were the descendants of John Roebling, who invented the wire, the spun wire rope, and the parallel wire main cable for suspension bridges, had the contract to build the main cable, which was built in place by carrying individual wires across from the San Francisco side to the Marin side and back again with a shuttle or spinning wheel that when finally perfected on the Golden Gate Bridge, was able to take three bytes of wire, which is six individual wires across at the same time. Well, once the main cable was constructed or spun, then the rest of the bridge was uh, quite easy co to construct. The suspender ropes were draped over the main cable, and the st stiffening truss was started at at the towers and built both ways from the tower and, and there are a lot of pictures around that most of you have seen that show the construction of the bridge during this stage. One day I was on the backspan when they were just building the catwalks and the rails weren't on, just the parts of the catwalk was on and pretty soon the wind came up and the catwalk started to move up and down so heck I just got my safety belt and tied on to one of the cables there to make sure that I wouldn't go off. Well, if anything happened, I'll still be up here. I had never worked on a bridge before. I used to be a commercial electrician or a residential, either one. And, but I had never worked on any bridges before. It's just, this just happened to be a job. In those days, there was hundreds of men out of work, and you were lucky to have a job. Well, the work day was uh, 8 o'clock in the morning until 4.30 in the afternoon. and. Uh, of course, at 8 o'clock you'd go there, then we used to have to climb inside the towers to get up to the top, and uh, then we, at nighttime we'd leave at 4.30. It used to take us about a half hour to go up in the morning and about 15 or 20 minutes coming down at night, so you'd kind of slide down the steel ladders. And we were getting a, a large pay of $9 a day. <laughs> the one thing I think was new is when they decided to put the net down underneath you know, to, in case anybody fell off, that they would be saved. So I guess it did save quite a few of them that fell into the net, except the day that the catwalk broke. Well, I was working on the catwalk, and somebody says, the catwalk is falling. So, heck, I jumped up on the main cable, and then somebody says, no, the net broke. So I ran down to on the concrete where the concrete hadn't been poured, and I 
look down, here was some man hanging onto the steel, nothing between him and the water, so me and a couple other guys lowered a rope down, pulled him up, and, the, and he didn't say thank you or nothing. He had a pipe in his mouth, and he just started to walk towards San Francisco. We never did see him again. <laughs> On the Bay Bridge, we'd have no net, no nothing. The Golden Gate, the first time they ever used the net, boy, it was just like night and day. Boy, it was beautiful, you know. We, how can we get killed? We'd fall in the net. So we worked a little quick and a little faster and uh, kind of have a tendency to be a little careless. So that's what happened to me one day. See, I stepped on the wet beam there, stepped, Flipped three times and hit the net, and the net was touching the ground. I cracked four vertebrae. It was the St. Luke's Hospital, 12 weeks, and all the boys come out. In the meantime, while I was there, all the rest, there's about eight of us, eight of us that time. I was the third that fell. Eight, they come over. We formed a halfway to hell club right there at St. Luke's Hospital. And they, I couldn't get out there, so they all come. Didn't hurt them. They fell in the net and jumped up and went right back to work. Well, anyway, when I got out, it says, oh, you lost your nerve. You'll never be able to do that work anymore. So instead of coming home, I went right out there. Walked all over that thing. I was in the, one of the best riveting gangs. All we had to do is get 250 rivets a day, and we'd get 400, 450. It was a rough, tough job, cold, Wet, windy, man, you'd freeze, you'd freeze almost cold to death, kept working. But then, you had to have the stamina. You had to love it. I loved to do it anyway. You had to love to do it, otherwise you couldn't do it. It took four and a half years and $35 million to build the Golden Gate Bridge. On May 27, 1937, the Bridge District held a gala pedestrian day to introduce the bridge to an expectant public. Over 200,000 people crossed the bridge on foot. The next day, motorized traffic was allowed on the bridge for the first time. The Golden Gate Bridge continues to stand as it did on opening day, as a testament to the vision of those who designed it, the sweat of those who built it, and a lesson in the human spirit to those who said it could never be done. It rightly takes its place not only as a landmark of the city of San Francisco, but as a landmark of the world.